sure the elder is. Is? Yes. Oh, you have it down? I got it. Alright. Well, you got it? I got it. We got it to where we send it to uh, Megan. I'll send it to What's that? Oh. Alright. Revelation chapter 11. Let's read verses 15 to 19. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there was, were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God. What am I reading through? Verse 19. Verse 19, okay. Saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and was and, and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. And the time of the dead they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants and the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hell. How do you spell hell? H A I L. H A I L. That's the kind of hell we're talking about, all right? <laughs> we don't like the other kind. No. And what was this kind? H A I L kind. Great. Give big balls of ice. <clears throat> Great balls of ice. Isn't that a, isn't that a Jerry Lee Lewis song? That's Red Ball's Fire. Oh, Red Ball's Fire. That's what happens in Revelation chapter 20, verse 9. Revelation 20, verse 9 talks about Red Ball's Fire. Red Ball's Fire, yeah. Okay, so looking at the timeline here, uh, at some point in time, we don't know, we don't know this right here, the time. And I'll call this close of probation, and then this period of time here, seven last plagues. Or the great time of trouble. That as well. The great time of trouble happens within the seven last plagues. You're right. And then we have, uh, you know, at the end of this, we have the second coming of Christ. I could continue this on out and say that this is a millennium, a thousand years in heaven. That's when nobody's on earth. Nobody's on earth. We're all in, all the saved are in heaven. And then this line would be the third coming. And we have the destruction of the wicked. In that question mark there, where would you put the uh, no buying and selling? <laughs> that close? Because, you know, I don't know for sure. But we're all close. What does she say? Did she, did she give us any time? But no. I thought it was like a year or two. She says that there's no time frame, there's no time prophecy. And our message at Seventh-day Adventist isn't based on time in between here and here. So you don't know when that bond fill law will fall in. <coughs> it seems like it's coming together now. Yes. I mean, yeah. Yeah. right. The reason why I say that is because uh, we're told in Revelation chapter 13, and we'll get there, right, is that uh, the beast power in Revelation chapter 13 which comes up out of the sea that, that's got the look of a leopard <coughs> or leopard. Right? Uh, has features of a bear and a lion. We go back to Daniel 7 to understand what that means. And this particular beast represents the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church power, the system, not the people in the pews. Good Christians in all different denominations, right? <clears throat> and that uh, they are going to uh, push this issue, which they've already begun trying to do, of Sunday sacredness in place of the fourth commandment, right? And uh, the Bible says ultimately the United States is going to join her 
and pushing the Sunday sacredness in place of the Fourth Commandment, when that happens, that's when this idea can't buy and sell take a vote. But then the government is the one who steps in and says, if you don't go along, we're going to be cut your currency out. We won't be able to have access to your bank account. And this is the only time in human history that this could take place. Right? This is the only time that, you know, if you get paid now, it's all digital, right? And so, currency is becoming more rare and rare, right? You use cash a lot less than what you used to. And so, I wanted to put this up here because what we've heard in Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 19 is talking about these events. And just, you know, because this is a kind of a transition. Starting in Revelation chapter 12 on, we'll see about uh, the seven last plagues and uh, the destruction of the wicked. In other words, the punishment that they get here at the end of time is all talked about there in Revelation chapter 11 that we just heard, right, that you just read. And it's a summary. This is what we're going to talk about from Revelation 12 on. We're going to talk about what he just read in Revelation chapter 11. So notice, when we did the six, the seven seals, right? We did six seals, there was a parenthetical uh, uh, place in there, and then we did the seven seal. We did six trumpets, now we did the parenthetical phrase of Revelation chapter 10, 1 through Revelation chapter 11, verse 14. It's, you know, and now we're getting to the seventh trumpet. And so, I want to start with the last verse. So you guys can tell me the timing of the seventh trumpet. Before we do that, I want you to tell me the timing of the sixth trumpet. Look in Revelation chapter 9, verse 13. What's it say? <clears throat> the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice before horns of the golden altar, which is before death. Oh, did you say 916? 913. Yeah. What, what piece of furniture from the sanctuary golden is... Altar. Okay, golden altar. So if you remember... On the north, we have the table of showbread, right? And then on the south, we have the lampstand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Interesting how, you know, the lampstand represents the Holy Spirit and support of the south, and we live in the south. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> All right, and this is the golden altar. <clears throat> what part of the sanctuary is the golden altar located? The holy place. This is the holy place, right? Okay, and this is the most holy place, right? And what's in the most holy place? The Ark of the Covenant. Ark of the Covenant, right? Okay, and so when we read in Revelation chapter 9, verse 13 about the golden altar, we are still under the sixth trumpet in the holy place. You see that? What does this veil represent in terms of timing? What year does this veil represent? 1844, right? So the veil represents the time of 1844. You know, I could just... Right here, that veil is 1844. So, when we read about articles in the holy place, we know it's prior to 1844. What happens in 1844? Jesus goes to the most holy place. Yeah, Jesus goes to the most holy place. So in this particular, the pre-advent, second, before second coming, judgment starts, right? In heaven. Remember the trumpets are about judgment? <clears throat> so you see the sixth trumpet is still in the holy place. But notice what Revelation 11.19 says. I had a big thing up here. Did you just see that about Thomas is here today? Yeah. What's it say in 1119? The temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testimony. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and the great air. This is what he saw, right? Of 1119. He saw the Ark of the Covenant there in the most holy place. So the seventh trumpet is 
Anytime 1844 forward, we're talking about a time the seventh trumpet to blow. Okay? We're talking about post-1844, because now we're in the most holy place. Okay? It's interesting to me. Well, we'll get to this verse and talk about it in detail. So let's go back to verse 15 and read it again, 11 15. Who's got it? And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So it's interesting how God. Even though he is the king of the universe, he's the one that created it, he's the one that, that has authority over it, he's the one that rules over the universe, right? You know, uh, it's interesting how you look up in the night sky and see all these stars, and, you know, if you could see far enough, you could see all these other galaxies that are full of stars, right? And they're not running into each other, and they're not causing chaos and havoc up there. It's not just a horrible mess. God's in control of everything. Right? Mm -hmm. Yet, he allowed sin and Satan to have dominion over the earth for a period of time. Right? And why do you think he did that? To show what sin looks like. Because nobody else in the universe had ever seen sin. Can we cut the heat down? Just get it below 110. I mean, is it 110? You got it. Yeah, yeah, even the ladies think so. Yeah. I think it's too early for me to start sweating. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So, yes, Wanda? He wanted the universe to see how it played out, right? Let's say what the end results of Satan. That's exactly right. Because everything God created was for the benefit of his created beings, right? Right. He is nothing but a blessing to created beings. And yet, Lucifer stands up and made these false accusations about God. And these angels and other created beings out there that had never sinned, you know, they had never heard a lie. They had never heard a false accusation. And here the devil is planting these false ideas about God in the minds of these beings. And God says, okay, we'll let the devil's ideas play out so they can see the results of his philosophy, brother. Oh, okay. Okay, I, 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 sorry, brother. I stepped in your toes. I, I apologize. So that's the reason why he allowed it to happen, right? It's called the great controversy. Every one of us play a role in this great controversy. Okay, we play a role. You know, whose side are you on in this war between Christ and Satan? Right? I want to be on Christ's side. How about you? Amen. Amen. Jesus says, "If you love me." Keep my commandments. John 14, 15. That shows whose side you're on. Romans chapter 6, verse 16 says, you show whose side you're on by whom you obey. Right? If you're going to live a life trying to satisfy simple desires of the flesh, you're not on Christ's side. Okay? You need to call upon Jesus to save you. Amen. Don't try to wait until you stop doing that. Go do it today. Don't wait. Right? He's the one that can fix you. He's the one to give you strength. He's the one that delivers you. Right? He's the one that can heal you of this disease called sin. And then when you get better, he's the one that gets glory. Yeah, exactly. And so, when we look in this idea of these kingdoms, notice what Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 says. You remember Daniel? You got a statue there. And the head of gold represents the Babylonian Empire from 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. And the chest and arms of silver represent the Medes and the Persians from 539 B.C. to 331 B.C. And then the belly and thighs of brass, as it says in the King James, or bronze in the New King James, or other newer translations, it says that it represents the kingdom of Greece, 331 B.C. to 168 B.C. Then the legs of iron represent the Roman Empire from 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. Then you got the feet, which are part of clay and part of iron, representing uh, the division of the Roman Empire into ten nations, ultimately becoming the uh, continent of Europe. 
And that started in 476 and all the way to the time of the toes. At the time of the toes, you have the second coming of Jesus now. We are living on the time of the toes, right? Oh, man. Yeah, thank you. Right, run almost at the end of coming. Yeah. Oh, we're out, people. Okay. And so, notice what it says whenever Christ's kingdom comes at the end of this statue and hits the statue and, and destroys it. What happens in Daniel 2, verse 44? And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall be left to shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these other kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Alright, and that's what we're talking about here in Revelation chapter eleven, verse fifteen. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Notice what it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 33. We have Gabriel, the angel, meeting with Mary and telling her about um, this child she's going to have. And what does it say about him in Luke 1, 33? No end, right? So this is what we're talking about in 11.15. We're talking about that kingdom that would have no end. And uh, if you notice it says, why do you think it's worded the way it is? The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. Why didn't it say, and our Christ? Because I think these are the voices of angels that had never fallen. These are the voices of beings that have never had been redeemed. These are the voices of beings, sinless beings that live in heaven, and they're watching this all play out, and they're making a statement about God the Father and God the Son here. Because Christ, and maybe some of your Bibles has this, it may say anointed in there. Some of your translations may say anointed, because the word Christ means anointed. And when it says, of his Christ, it means that these, these beings are talking about God the Father and God the Son, right? Right. And they have never had to be redeemed, yeah. right? And so that's the way that they would say it, you see. And these are the voices that John heard in this vision on the Isle of Patmos. Interesting how uh, I, I think there's a... Similarity in Psalms 2. Notice what it says in Psalms 2. I'm hoping everybody in here reads at least a portion of Psalms every week. At least, right? Okay? I mean, part of your daily Bible reading is you read a whole chapter of Proverbs, right? 31 Proverbs, one chapter for each day of the month. Okay? And then, you know, uh, you switch it up a little bit, read some of the New Testament, you know, then pick out a psalm to read. You know, switch it up some. And notice what it says in Psalms 2. Let's read 1 and 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Where did we get that phrase? Right? Do we see that in Revelation 11.15? The exact phrase. I think we're hearing this exact phrase from Psalms 2, verse 2. And notice, what do these nations of the earth say? In verse 3. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast their cords from us. So, the nations are saying, we don't want God to rule over us. Right? We don't want God to be our king. We like following the devil and our sinful desires. You know, we don't want that. We want to sat, we want to continue following our own sinful desires and trying to satisfy those, and we don't want God to save us. So they're resisting the kingdom of Christ, right? They're resisting it. This is pretty cool. Have you ever noticed what Jesus says? in Matthew 18. Can I go down a rabbit trail? I got permission to do We like rabbit trails. Oh, okay, yeah. This is pretty neat. 
Okay, Matthew chapter 18. Jesus is talking here. And in Matthew chapter 18, we have, uh, I'm sorry, let's see, it's 16 18. I think I messed up there. That's what I'm focused on, Matthew chapter 16, and verse 18 is the key verse. But let's start there in verse 17 and go all the way through verse 19. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Notice in verse 18, it says, I also say to you that you are Peter, right? And Peter means uh, a small rolling pebble, right? Stone. Petros is a stone. Is something that is movable. And then he says, and on this rock, Petra, in the Greek, is something immovable. So he's talking about himself. Right? Now, this has been misinterpreted, especially by the Catholic Church. I remember Bruce, I went to the Vatican, and I, and I walked in in St. Peter's Basilica, and I looked up, and I saw on you know the big dome right all around on the the base of that dome are these words from Matthew chapter 60 verse 18 and they try to say that Peter was the first pope and you know that the church is built on Peter and that's supposed to be where Peter's buried you know he he died in Rome we don't we don't really know okay. where he's buried pastor one I mean we did see the chain around <laughs> Peter supposedly right uh, one pastor pointed out that the city of Jerusalem will be built on strong foundations that <coughs> will be the disciples. So in a way, it will be, the city will be built on Peter. Yeah, yeah. At least his name is on the foundation, right? Yeah. But he's not this cornerstone. Where he was in there. That's right. And, and here, uh, Christ is showing a difference between the word Peter in the Greek, Petros, and the word rock in the Greek is Petra, and Christ is the rock of our salvation, right? It says that in the Old New Testament. And so uh, he's saying to you, you're, you're a movable stone, but I am immovable. I'm the, I'm the foundation. I'm the cornerstone, right? So that's what he's saying here. And he says, I will build my church. Christ will do that, right? And the gates of Hades shall not prevail. Okay, so the kingdom of this world is like Satan wants to shut God out. All right. So imagine that the kingdoms of this world have shut, has like a wall around it, has shut gates, trying to keep Christ out of Satan's kingdom. Okay. Now, unfortunately, we're born in Satan's kingdom. All right. But what does he say there? These gates that Satan puts up to keep Christ out will not prevail. Right. That means the church is storming the gates. And we go into Satan's kingdom and share the gospel and Christ is able to save people out of, out of Satan's kingdom. You see? So he's saying here that Satan's kingdom is not going to prevail. His kingdom is not going to survive. So why do they use the word Hades and not hell or, or something else? Well, if you look at the King of James, it does say the word hell. But that is the Greek word that's used there. So they just use the Greek word of Hades there. No, and Hades means, means grave or death, oh, okay. right? So isn't the kingdom of Satan death? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right? So I think that's the relationship there, Mark, okay. gotcha. is we're talking about the kingdom of Satan. The kingdoms of this world are the kingdoms of Satan. Right? The gates of death. The gates of death, right. And what is he trying to do? He wants to save us from death. He wants to save us and have eternal life. And so the only way is if we allow Christ to come into our lives and save us from our sins. Yeah. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. So we see this idea of there is a battle between two kingdoms here, Satan's kingdom and Christ's kingdom. And ultimately we see God has allowed Satan to have this time so that the uh, beings in other worlds, and even us who are going to be saved and have eternal life, we've learned the lesson. Sin doesn't satisfy. It only destroys 
right? And sin is rebellion against God. You can call it iniquity. You can call it transgression. You can call it rebellion. But that's what it is. And that's what God wants to uproot out of us. And so that we can have the, the peace and bliss that other created beings who have never sinned are having today. Right? We want to be a part of their realm. <laughs> right now we're quarantined. But someday we'll be, it'll be safe to take us there. Right? So that's what I see here in Revelation chapter 11 verse 15. We have this idea that the kingdoms of this world are temporary. God's just allowing it to take place. But eventually, he's going to put a stop to all this, and he's going to take control and ultimately reign. In other words, the wicked are going to be uh, cast out of the kingdom, and it's only going to be for the saved. The people who have allowed Christ to change their hearts, to convert them so that they want to love and obey God and be a part of his universe. I can't wait to uh, experience God's universe. You know what I mean? Right? You know how Gabriel was on the throne of God and then Daniel starts praying and then Gabriel's there with Daniel, right? So, I mean, how far away the throne, physically the throne of God and Daniel, what, what uh, I don't know, 200 billion light years away? I mean, what, what do you think? I don't know, right? I just don't know. The open space in Orion, somewhere past that is where heaven's at. I, I don't know how far away. It takes 12 minutes. You know what? Did you say it took 12 minutes to get How long does it take you to read the prayer in Daniel chapter 9? I think, you know, it, it, you could do it in uh, probably, I don't know, 4.7 minutes. Uh, Vic, Victoria could do it in 4.3. Right? It doesn't take long. In other words, he traveled, who knows, 200 million light years in four minutes. You know? So we, we'll be able to visit these other planets, you see. It's not live. we got to jump in a space. We call that ship. traveling at the so, speed of prayer. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and the speed of thought, right? And, and it's just, it's awesome. It's an awesome thought, you know. Some of the places we're going to be able to visit, and it's not going to take a long time to get there. It's a long time to stay. So when he takes us on this um, trip, it'll take seven days. He must be going to take us on. Okay, so Sister Wanda is saying it's going to take seven days to get from earth to heaven. Whenever Jesus comes back and gets us, John chapter 14, verse 1, right, Owen? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I ain't going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive it myself. That where I am, where he is today, you shall be also. we shall be also. Right? Yeah, would, it, would it be instantly? No. He'll come back, and he's got God the Father's with him. And all these angels that never sinned, the army of heaven that's with him, right? That's from Revelation chapter 19, we'll see that. He's going to come back into this atmosphere, and then the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, let's have somebody read that, verses 16 and 17, right? Isn't that a great passage? It's a great passage. We also had that memorized, right? Yep, that's it. You know? For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Amen. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Amen. Right. Isn't that cool? Yeah. We're going to be in the air, Owen. And then how long is it going to take God to get us back? to the New Jerusalem that he's been preparing for us. Seven days. That's the scenic uh, route. He's going, to he's going to take the scenic route. He wants to show us a few things, right? That's the cool thing. And it right? says that silence in heaven for a half an hour. That's the verse where we get it from. Where's that verse found? Yes, Revelation 8 one. So that's how, you know, if a day in prophecy equals a literal year, then a half an hour equals about a week. And so, I think it's appropriate, you know, to, a week, seven days. Or, or it might even be six days to make it there for Sabbath. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe so. Maybe so. I've heard, I've heard people say that they think that we'll actually celebrate Sabbath en route at another one of the unfallen worlds. So, I, I have the same opinion that we'll celebrate the Sabbath before we actually walk through the pearly gates. And the reason why I say that is... Because there are some Christians who live down through time in history past 
who are now asleep in the grave waiting a resurrection. They have never knew the truth about the Sabbath. Everybody is going to keep a Sabbath before they enter into the pearly gates. <coughs> right? Right? I think everybody's going to do that. And so, I, that's why I think that. You know. Well, they have to if it's seven days. Well, that's what I think, yeah. you know. So, Lori? Um, you know, just talking about, you know, God coming back to get his people and all that. I love the text in Zechariah 13 that talks about that he's going to replace a third of the eight, you know, like a third of us will be saved, two thirds will be lost. And that's, he'll recapture the third that he was lost in heaven and so he can all forward again. Yeah. That's, you know, because Revelation chapter 12 says that a third of the angels were deceived by Satan and chose to rebel against Christ and were cast out to this earth and are the demons today and that we're basically going to replace them in some way, right? So a third of the human race is going to be saved. No, I, I, I don't, it, you know, the, he says in Matthew chapter 7, broad is the way you know, to destruction and few who find it, right? In other words, difficult is the way to salvation, and it's a narrow way. One man wide, Christ, and the only, there's going to be few who find it. So I, I don't know. I don't think a third of mankind is going to be there. No. More? Less. <coughs> right? I don't think 33% are going to make it. I just don't know. Right? But I think we're going to replace the third of the angels that were cast out. We don't know how, what that number is. But like Lori made a reference, it, it makes uh, you know God's family in heaven holy. Right? They chose to rebel with Satan. You know, all of us have chosen to rebel with Satan, but we've now chosen to be saved from this rebellion through Christ. Right? Amen. It's still going to be a huge number. How many people have been and are and be, you know, so you yeah, that yeah. I mean, comes. Revelation 14, uh, verse 7, I, I mean, uh, not verse 7, but uh, Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, says, <laughs> um, he says, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed the robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And, you know, in verse 9 it says it's a great multitude. So I, I don't know. I mean, it's going to be a large number, but not, you know, it's just my opinion. Yeah. Not a third, but I don't know. Right? Yeah. I just don't know. So, the main thing is we need to make sure that uh, ourselves and our family members and people in our sphere of influence that we can share with, right, are ready for the second coming. And I think that's our responsibility. So I think we've covered... Uh, Chapter 11 and verse 15, okay. What do, you, what do you think? Any questions? All right. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God. Could somebody please read Revelation 4, verse 10. Revelation 5, verse 14. And Revelation 7, verse 1. 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, I wouldn't agree with this. You are worthy, O Lord, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So these are the 24 elders, right? Mm hmm. And notice how um, they have crowns, and they say that, you know, our crowns are nothing compared to your crown, right? And they actually put it at his feet, right? It's the opposite of the ways of this world. The ways of this world is, I want to try to accumulate all I can, right? Either we, uh, individuals do that, or leaders in nations do that, you know? I'll, I'll, I think I'd like to have the resources in that country. Let's go conquer it, right? I mean, that's the opposite of the attitude of these kings, these uh, royal priesthood that we see in these 24 elders. And uh, notice verse uh, 5, verse 14. 
And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. What are they falling down and worshiping? You know, see the key theme of these 24 elders in 410 and in 514. What about 711? Pastor, there's some in 5-9 also. They yeah, sing. that's true. That's true. Just trying to establish a, a pattern with these 24 elders. What's 711 say? And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. So it's a theme of these 24 elders. They're, they're near God's throne. They have their, right? They have their own throne. Didn't Christ say that about his followers? Did he say that, you know, you're going to sit on thrones, right? Did he say that? And they fell on their faces and worshiped God. This is a typical theme that you see throughout the book of Revelation of these 24 elders. So, um, We've already discussed who the 24 elders are. From what you brought up in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, it says they have been redeemed. Mm -hmm. Right? So they must have been. On the earth. Right, from the earth. Mm -hmm. So they must have been people who lived on the earth who had sinned at one time and now they're up in heaven. Right? We can name three of them. Yeah. By name. Right? Moses, mm -hmm. Elijah, and Enoch. Right? And so. Um, it's interesting to see their attitude toward God and that should be our attitude today do we have the same attitude do we see Christ God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit as the King sitting upon our throne of our hearts I mean are we submitted and surrendered to God are we willing to follow the principles that he's given us in the word of God Willing to die to self like Paul did, 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. You know, because we all have temptations in our lives that we have to die to, right? We have to say no. Even though we desire it, we want to do what's right. That's the conflict going on inside us. So is Christ king? If you were one of the 24 elders, did you do this? Would you fall down and throw your crown at the feet of their throne and say, you know, we're not even worthy to have this crown. Oh, we do. Bruce, what, what, throw what one is, out. The four beasts, what is that? Okay. Uh, these are uh, cherubim and seraphim. Okay. The word beast, uh, I, I don't think it's translated correctly there. Uh, if you look back in Revelation chapter 4, uh, if you notice, uh, other translations say four living creatures, right? They don't say beasts. Because typically we see a beast uh, in Bible prophecy represents a nation or a kingdom. And in this particular case, uh, these are, notice verse 8 of Revelation chapter 4, they have six wings, right? And I think you're referring back to Isaiah chapter 6, when it's talking about the seraphim that he saw in the Say the beasts relate to uh, the beasts of Ezekiel's hand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Ezekiel chapters one and chapter ten, right? Also, he saw these same creatures, right? So these are these amazing created beings that not sure what they are. I mean, when you look at how they're described here. Uh, it, it's nothing like what we see on this earth, right? You know, when he's seeing this in vision, so I don't know if what he's describing is actually physically what they look like, but I think there's some symbolism going on there too. But there are amazing beings that are next to God's throne that uh, help with the administration of the universe, I'm assuming. I think we'll get to know them once we get there. But they're not really bees, okay? They're poor living creatures. And if you look in uh, Isaiah chapter 6, let's read verse 2. Um, you can see there is a parallel. Isaiah 6, 2, and, and like our brother said in the back, Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10, I think they're talking about the same beings. Okay? It's the same characteristics. 
So we did a really, really detailed study on these before. What's it say there? You got it on the S62? And it stood, and it stood, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six, six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. So this is the only being in the Bible that I know of that has six wings, is a seraphim. Right? It's some type of created being. We have there in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2. But I would read Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 10, then Ezekiel chapter 10, and to get more information about these beings. So, Bruce, um, check into that and see if you have some more questions about it. Okay. Uh, I think we covered verse 16. Are we okay with that? Any questions about verse 16, chapter 11? Verse 17, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. So it's this idea that he's allowed sin and Satan to reign on this earth for a period of time to show that the principles of Satan's ideology and philosophy only cause destruction, pain, and misery, right? And unfortunately, we've all bought into it in some way or another. That's why when we read the Bible, it's reprogramming our brains to have more of the philosophy of God, of love, of, un of selfless love, right? And that's the key principle. And so, um, it's interesting how they address, O oh Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was who is to come. Uh, I think you'll notice there's probably a comment in some of your Bibles that talk about the one who is to come. Um, they think that's an added phrase, and they just put in the one who is and the one who was. Well, they say the one who is to come has happened right here. He's already, this is the, talking about he's finally taking back the reins of this earth is what I uh, is talking about and referring to. Any questions about verse 17? All right. So here we get into the chart. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. And the, why are the nations angry? Is that what we read in Psalms 2? How the nations are angry? They don't want to be ruled by God. Right? They want to resist Christ's kingdom. They're angry that God is taking back control of this world. And this ultimate battle called Armageddon is between the kingdoms of this world, the kingdoms of Satan, and when Christ comes back, they don't want to submit. They don't want to be a part of Christ's kingdom. So the nations are angry. We see this anger taking place. Have you noticed ever since 1844, have you noticed that when you look at the wars before 1844, uh, how they had armies, you know, that, uh, and the battles that took place, I think of the Revolutionary War, if you see how many Americans died in the Revolutionary War, you can look it up and you can Google it, right? It's, you know, a few, a few thousand, right? And then you jump over here, past 1844, you get to the Civil War, and then you go forward to World War I and World War II, and we see it just escalates to multi-millions of people dying, right? I mean, the, the Civil War, how many Americans died? Let me see yeah, near 700,000, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, You're close to 700,000, right? Yeah, and so <clears throat> you can see the nations are angry. I mean, we have wars and rumors of wars all the time now. Isn't that what Jesus said was one of the signs of the end of time? Right? <clears throat> yeah, that's right. And so the nations definitely are angry. And we could see an attack on Christian principles. We used to be a Christian nation here in the United States, right? Used to be. Right. And now, if you notice, what's that? We still have it on the dollar. We have, we have seen, for long. in God we trust on the dollar, right. And if you notice, 
I mean, our country and the rest of the world has gone the way of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes. I mean, we are living in modern Sodom and Gomorrah. And, uh, the, parallels are the parallels are uncanny. It's almost like the people, they didn't study the Bible, they didn't study history, and they're repeating the same thing over again, right? They're going, and Jesus predicted that this idea of the homosexual lifestyle being pushed upon uh, the earth and being promoted on this earth is going to, one of the signs of the end of time that is coming as soon. And the sacrifice of babies. Exactly. That's another one, too. We see these horrible things taking place in our world. And we're like, you know, this is horrible. Why are they doing this? Why are they pushing these things? Yeah, you know, some of the uh, some of the things that comes out of Washington D.C. is just shocking to me, right? You know why? Why do you promote these things that just damage us and hurt us as citizens of this country? And of course, the world follows the United States, and we see this uh, promotion of Sodom and Gomorrah going on throughout the whole world. The same principles. Wow, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and the Bible calls that lifestyle an abomination. I mean, you can't use a stronger word than that because it destroys the family, which destroys society. Maybe it destroys society. Uh, then that you're accomplishing what the devil wants to do. DCS. Yeah. DCS yeah. is against the family. You're following in the. They're following the pathway of Sodom and Egypt. Yes. Just like France. Right, exactly. You know, who is the Lord that he should, that I, you know, that I should hear his voice or obey him? And uh, that's exactly what's happening today. I mean, you heard lately how uh, it's in the liberal politics. They're talking about how rural white Christians, specifically Vincent's Christians, are the greatest enemy of democracy in our country. Yeah. That's what they say. It's, it's crazy. You know, the, the world paints itself as being our peace and our joy. That's right. And that's the people of the world. Right. They don't look for Christ. Right. When I notice, uh, you know, you watch some of the television shows today, and they're promoting this immoral lifestyle. If you have problems, let's go get a drink, you know? <laughs> and, and, and some crazy things as a result. Thomas? It's, uh, it's truly, it's just a heart issue that we have going on. And in Romans, you can see, I think it's chapter 2, where he talks about, there are people that don't know the law, that still follow God's law, because he made it so abundantly obvious through, you know, just because of you know, minds and our conscience and through nature, you can, it's people that don't know the law can easily follow God's law. Without yeah, and they're, ta they're talked about here in verse 18 at the very end of the and verse. Not, it, 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 people that know the law, it, a lot of it's, it makes it even worse because they don't have any excuse, and yet they are still, those can be the worst ones. And right, so they nowadays, the heart. now in our, here in, our, in this world that we live in, they have, everybody has access to know. What, it, what, what we are supposed to do and what God's law is. We are, uh, you know, easiest access of all of history. And yet, here we are, likely like it was with blood. So, right. So, I, I think Revelation chapter 11, verse 18, when it says, The nations are angry, your wrath has come. What is the wrath of God? The same. It's the seven last plagues, right? So that's why I have this up here. So you can see, you know, when it says the nations are angry and your wrath has come, the seven last plagues is the wrath of God on this world, okay? It's destroying, just like how the stone is cut out without hands, Daniel 2, and destroys the kingdoms of this world. This is where the kingdoms of this world are going through this uh, destruction process because the wrath of God is being poured out upon the kingdoms of this world. Okay? And what are the kingdoms of this world doing during this period of time? They're trying to kill us, the ones who are alive on the earth during this time, the Christians, right? But they blame us for the wrath of God. That's the end. Right? And that's when the death decree 
There's the death decree that takes place here and says we're going to go out and kill all these Sabbath-keeping Christians because they're causing all these miseries on us. And so when you have the death decree, this is the, this time of trouble that the Bible refers to. It happens during the seven last plagues. So nations are angry. Why are they angry? Well, you, I mean, we see this happening right now. But right here, when we get over past this line, the close of probation, and the plagues are being poured out, they really get angry at us, right? And they're blaming us for that what happened. You know, the time of Elijah, whenever he says it's not going to rain, he goes and sees King Ahab, the king of Israel, and what does the king say? You trouble Israel. You trouble Israel. He blamed his troubles on the prophet of God. Right. Well, we're going to be blamed too. Will we know that probation is over with at that time when it happens? You know, I, I, I think we're going to know when the seven last plagues start being poured out, and this is massive type of destruction in this world. We're going to say, you know, the close of our have taken place. Do you think COVID-19 was part of that or not? That's getting us ready for it. I think it's getting us ready for it. I think you're right. We haven't seen the National Sunday Law yet. Okay? The National Sunday Law is going to take place before the close of probation. That wakes people up and say, what, what, what are you doing here? And it gives us an opportunity to show the true Sabbath from the Bible so that <coughs> people can accept it. But that takes place before uh, we have this situation of the seven last So you think it's going to be abundantly clear to the remnant that the seven last place has started? Well, it's possible, yeah. I mean, uh, the place could be more severe in one place than another, right? So if you're living over here and you're not experiencing that severity, then you you, you may be questioning it, right? I, I have heard I have heard Adventists say that the Sunday law is a close of probation for Sabbath keepers. Yeah, I think at that point in time we know what's taking place and we can we have the information to choose, right? But there's people who don't have the information, and there's a period of time here, you know, this period of time right here that uh, people of the world have the opportunity to repent and turn back to God, right? Because last chance. Last chance, right. And so, um, whenever this takes place, this death decree, you know then we're in the middle of, we're in, in the seven last words, when that death decree takes place. It seems like you'd know when that Sunday law goes in. This is a kind of one. There you go. Absolutely, absolutely. We see the Sunday law. Yeah. It's going to be worldwide. It is. It is going to be worldwide. I, I think it starts locally and then, and then ultimately goes worldwide. They've got Sunday laws in some states now. Yeah. Right. In some countries, they, they do. Some good. states and some countries. Vince, thank you. Uh, do you have any feeling for how long the sealing of God's people take? I think it's taking place now. I think God's people being sealed is taking place now. I don't know how much time between the sealing of God's people and the close of probation. I just don't know. Right? Uh, what are we talking about? A year? Seven years? I don't know. Do you know how long those seven last plagues are going to last? It can't last long. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't it yesterday on the radio you were talking about? You don't think it would be more than a year? Somewhere I don't know. I just don't I don't have the answer. So will you look that up and see if you can find that? Brother? I was going to ask about the 24 elders. Yes. What do you? Who do you think this group is? <laughs> well, you're not going to lie to me. We know three of them. We yeah, know. we know three of them, right? So let's read Revelation chapter five, verse nine. I made a reference that we didn't actually read it, and we'll establish, I think, who it is here. Look at the characteristics of them. First of all, you see. What they say here in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Who has it? They sang a new song, saying, uh, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou art slain and hast redeemed us by the blood out of every kindred, tongue, and people, and nation. So these are people that have been redeemed, right? So these are people who used to live on the earth that have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Any questions about that? Pastor, it's interesting it says out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, like maybe they weren't 
I mean, it sounds like they come from all over. Is right? the number 24 maybe symbolic? Yeah, I think it's representing, you know, you have the 12 tribes in the Old Testament, you got the 12 disciples in the New Testament. It's almost like you're, it's representing humans that were involved with God's people in the Old and New Testament that are up in heaven now representing us. Uh, I think uh, Revelation 5 verse 8 um, mentioned the 24 elders, but how do you connect 8 and 9? And say well, the 24 same? elders is the last group mentioned in verse 8. And of course, uh, verse 8 isn't, uh, there's, no, there's no verses when he wrote it, right? right? So if you, if you took out the verses and just read it like a letter, then I think uh, verse 9 is referring back to the last group mentioned there in verse 8. It says they sang this song, referring to the people before it. Right. The 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp, golden bowls full of incense for the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song, saying. So, you know, it looks to me that it's referring back to that group of the 24 elders there. And if you notice the word elder, Elder is only referred to a human being, right? Have you noticed that? The word elder, if you look at it, when I put the Greek word up, look at every time it's used in the Greek, you can see it's not referring to any, any other person. So I think it's representatives of fallen humanity that are up in heaven now. And um, if you notice, we have, we have the three, right? Enoch is the first. And then we have uh, uh, Moses and Elijah, right? And we have Moses and Elijah show up again in Matthew chapter 17 at the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses represents all the ones who are going to die and be resurrected. And Elijah represents the ones who are going to be translated at the second coming and never see that. So, you know, they were chosen to meet with Christ before he goes to the cross. And then, as we go to Matthew, chapter, uh, uh, let's see, Matthew, chapter 27, and verse 51, I'm going to see where we need to end, I would say, let's go through verse 53, Matthew, 27, 51 to 53. What's it say there? And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Alright, so if there's 24, and we have three of them mentioned here, that means 21 resurrected there in Matthew 27. Okay? Now notice Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Does that mean that none, none of the 24 elders could be any of the disciples because it has to be people that, grow, that died before Jesus rose up from the dead? Right. Maybe Abraham. We don't know who it is. We don't know. John the Baptist. John the Baptist. If he was the greatest <laughs> born among women, wouldn't he be one of the ones? Yes. And wouldn't he make the biggest impact in the people at that, that? So John the Baptist walks in the city and telling about Jesus. They're going to say, what? I thought he had his head chopped off. You know, what is going on here? <laughs> was he a big man? Somebody said he was a big man. We don't know. I don't know. I don't know. What's Ephesians 4 8 say? This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. So notice, when he ascended to heaven, he took some of the, he took these resurrected ones from Matthew 27 with him. Right? And so they're now in heaven. And that's why I think that these, this group here, is the 24 elders. That we read about in Revelation. Seems like if any others had made it to heaven, we would have been told about it. Right, right. 
That's the only ones that we've been told. Right? It's the only ones we've been told that have gone to heaven. And there's, and could there be others? Maybe. I don't. I don't know for sure. But it sure seems logical to say that the three that we know from the Old Testament and the 21 are the ones mentioned here in Matthew 27. Uh, if there's 24 elders, and, I, and these elders are meaning, the word elder means a human, right? And they're redeemed. So these ones used to live on the earth. It says that it specifically means they're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So it seems to me that they've got to be Makes sense. 24 people who used to be in that realm. You know, it could be. You know, I was thinking about the timing there because Acts two says David hadn't been resurrected yet, right? Acts, the book of Acts says that David hadn't been resurrected. Right. It said he's in his grave. Right. Right. So I don't. I'm, I'm, yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't David. Right. And so probably not David, right? And so, uh, so that's how we got the 24 elders being used to be people here that now are in heaven. And they're representing humanity uh, during the pre Advent judgment phase. You know, I think God, if you look in Daniel chapter 7, right? And I really wanted to go there uh, and talk about that, receiving the kingdom. Can we do that next time? Can we, can we go back and look at that? Okay. Um, and we'll pick it up there la next time, but you can definitely see that uh, we have a huge group of people around the throne of God during the pre advent judgment from Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. And so I think this group, representing people from the earth is also their present for this as well. Mm -hmm. Father in heaven, we thank you for these great truths in the word of God. Uh, we ask that you help us be a part of Christ's kingdom. If we have made the decision to surrender all and allow Jesus to be the king on our thrones, then help us do so today. We call upon you, Jesus. Save us from our sin. Save us from our sinful desires. Uh, fill us with your spirit and give us desires for righteousness, holiness, love, Help us, God, experience your agape, selfless love. And we thank you for this privilege and this opportunity to be a part of Christ's kingdom. This is what we choose. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.